Let's now look at a method for calculating approximate energies of the helium atom called Hartree-Fock theory. So we have our total Hamiltonian here. We have two kinetic energy terms, kinetic energy of electron one and kinetic energy of electron two. We have our attraction of electron one to the nucleus, which has a charge of two in atomic units. We have our attraction to, of electron two to the nucleus, and we have the repulsion of the electrons to each other. So we're going to approximate this wave function as a product of two orbitals. So an orbital is just a one electron wave function. So the product of these one electron wave functions for electron one and electron two give us our total wave function, which depends on the spatial coordinates of electron one and electron two, making it a total of six dimensions before we include spin, just six spatial dimensions for now. And from the variational theorem, we know that if these are normalized, that the expectation value for our energy is going to be the integral over the entire domain of the wave function, in this case all six spatial dimensions of e the spatial dimensions of each electron, all three of them for each electron, times the complex conjugate of the wave function, that's psi star of orbital one, psi star of orbital of electron two, then our total Hamiltonian acting on the wave function again, which is psi of R1 and psi of R2. Okay, but what we want to do in order to make this separable, in order to make it uh, something that we can solve for each electron one at a time, we want to get rid of this one over R12 operator, this electron-electron repulsion. It's not separable because we can't uh, separate it into something that just depends on electron one and electron two because it has this difference in their positions uh, in the denominator here. So we're gonna get an effective electron repulsion which can be separated into equations which give us uh, a, a Schrodinger equation for each orbital. So what we're gonna do is we're going to have an effective Hamiltonian for each electron. So the effective Hamiltonian of electron one is going to be the kinetic energy of electron one, <clears throat> one minus one half del squared one, second derivative with respect to all spatial coordinates, minus its attraction to the nucleus, two over R1. And then to account for its repulsion to the other electron, we're going to include this effective uh, potential operator here which is going to depend on its position. And this term here, this effective propulsion of the other electron, is <clears throat> referred to as a mean field. So this mean field, this mean field operator here, we can write this that this kind of effective electron repulsion as a position of the electron's coordinates, that's gonna be an integral over the coordinates of electron two of its wave function, psi star r2, psi r2, times the one over r12 operator up here. So what does this mean? Well. The psi star r2, psi r2, that's the probability density for where electron 2 is located. So the electron 2 has some probability density indicated by its psi star psi. And then electron 1 is, rep is repelled from that probability density by the Coulomb operator, by this 1 over r12 in atomic units. That would be e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r12 in si units. So basically we're integrating out the effect of the exact inter-electronic inter, uh, repulsion of these two here, and we're just integrating out to what the average repulsion felt by electron one is at, at a given point in space over the entire orbital, the entire probability density of electron two. So this is not exact, but this is a, an approximation to how we can estimate get a fairly decent estimate for what the repulsion of electron one is uh, due to the charge density of electron two and what the effect of that energy is on the wave function and the total energy for electron one. Okay, so once we have that, then we can reduce this to 
a one particle Schrodinger equation. We have our Hamiltonian, our effective Hamiltonian for particle one. So H psi of R1 is going to equal an energy, epsilon one, times psi of R1. Okay, so now what does this mean? This term down here, this epsilon one, that is going to be the orbital energy. So that is the energy of the electron which is in orbital uh, this psi r1 here. So if we if we think about what energy this electron has, this that is its orbital energy, this epsilon one here. And similarly, we would have a, an equation like this for electron two. We would have H2 effective psi of R2 equals epsilon two psi of R2. And this would have, uh, electron two would have its own effective Hamiltonian and that would be uh, with its, its kinetic energy, its attraction to the nucleus and its mean field generated from its repulsion from electron one. So replacing the ones and twos here, we would integrate over the position, the, the probability density of electron one, which electron two feels. So we have these two equations which we need to solve. So now this looks just like an eigenvalue problem. This looks like operator times function equals constant times function. And it is not exactly an eigenvalue function. This would be what we would call a pseudo eigenvalue equation. So it sort of looks like an eigenvalue equation, but there's one problem. And that problem is that this uh, Hamiltonian here depends on what the wave function for electron one is because we see electron one's wave function would appear in this effective uh, mean field operator here. And for, and for electron one, we also have the effect of electron two's wave function determines that. So electron one's wave function depends on electron two and electron two's wave function depends on electron one. So this gives us sort of a chicken and egg problem. So what we need to do is a procedure which is called the self-consistent field, which is the way you solve this type of problem within Hartree-Fock theory. And this is going to, we're going to generalize this later to all atoms and even all molecules. So this Hartree-Fock that we're talking about is going to generalize to any molecular system or atomic system you can think of. So this self-consistent field, what we're going to do is first we're going to guess some wave function. Say we guess the wave function of electron one, guess psi r1. And then we're going to use that, use our psi r1 in order to calculate our effective Hamiltonian And then our effective Hamiltonian, our, our sorry, our mean field operator here, it's going to give us our effective Hamiltonian. And from our effective Hamiltonian, we solve again for our wave function. Then we can calculate a new psi of r1 and r2, etc., whichever one we need. using that Hamiltonian there. And then once we've calculated a new uh, wave function here, a new psi r1 and a new psi r2 from these new effective Hamiltonians for each of them, we ask the question, did the wave function change between each of these steps here? Is our new wave function the same as our old wave function? And there are two possible answers to that. We can either say, we can either say yes, it did change, then we calculate 
based off of our new wave function, our new effective mean field, and then use that to get a new wave function, new mean field, new wave function. And then we continue this cycle until it doesn't change anymore. And then what we have is our final wave function. So basically the self-consistent field, the self-consistent part of it is we keep repeating this cycle until both the mean field and the wave function stay the same as we go around the cycle. So we have these we have this Hamiltonian, which is an effective one particle Hamiltonian for each electron, and we use this to calculate the the electron orbitals for each electron and their orbital energies. And once we and we do that by guessing something, guess some wave function to begin with, and then we can calculate the field, we can calculate the new wave function, calculate a new field, and continue until we finally have our wave function. And this, this, the basics of this procedure is what we're going to use uh, going forward for various different atoms, various different molecules, things like that. And that's how we're going to uh, look at all of the wave functions that we'll have for many electron atoms and then eventually molecules.